Shout joyful praises to God, all the earth. Sing about the glory of his name. Tell the world how glorious he is, Psalm 166, 1 and 2. I would like you to please stand for the reading of the sacred text. And this morning, we'll be taking turns. I will read a line. We're reading from Psalm 136, and it, it's designed to be an antiphonal reading where I will read one part, and your response is always the same. Your response is always, his faithful love endures forever. And perhaps by the end of this, we'll all believe that his faithful love does, in fact, endure forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. Give thanks to him who alone does mighty miracles. Give thanks to him who made the heavens so skillfully. Give thanks to him who placed the earth on the water. Give thanks to him who made the heavenly lights. The sun to rule the day. And the moon and stars to rule the night. Take time to look at the full moon tonight. Anyway, I'll keep going. He remembered our utter weakness. And he saved us from our enemies. He gives food to every living thing. Give thanks to the God of heaven. The word of the Lord. He will be increased for having been here today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was anticipating talking about a Thanksgiving theme today, there was a verse that came to my mind, and we'll look at it a little bit later, a text that, that has crossed my mind often when I think about Thanksgiving, because it's out of the ordinary, it's, it's, it's uh, different. But I would just like just to think about the idea of what, how Thanksgiving affects us, even in physical ways or in emotional ways and things like that. There was a, a study done that I found in 2003 by two um, university professors, Robert Emmons and Michael McCullough. And they were called, of all things, gratitude experts. I didn't know you could be an expert in gratitude, but ev evidently you can. They both have doctorates in studying gratitude, if you can imagine. But, one of the, some of the things that they found out about that is that there are physiological things that happen in our bodies when we express gratitude. Um, they found out that um, when they took some people who, in this case study, that they were supposed to, for two weeks, focus on all the negative things that are happening in their life, would be interested in being those people, and then they were focusing on, another group of people, focusing on the things that they were thankful for, the things that were going well in their life. And then they compared the two groups after a couple weeks. And they found that there was all kinds of things that happened, physiological things that could be measured that were different between the two groups. For example, practicing gratitude is related to 23% lower levels of a stress hormone cortisol, and led to 7% reduction in the biomarkers of inflammation in patients who had congestive heart defects. There were studies that suggested that gratitude led to the reduction in depression and blood pressure and an improvement in sleep quality among those with chronic pain and insomnia. And in one study, 88% of people who had said that they were suicidal reported feeling less hopeless after they wrote a letter of gratitude. So, one of these experts, Dr. Emmons, 
was asked, why is it that we find it so difficult or it's against inertia in us to, be, to, to think about the good things? We want to go to the bad things right away. Why, why is it that we do that? And this is his explanation. I'll read it for you. There is a negativity bias that is built into our brains, part of our factory installed equipment, as I would say. Although most people intuitively know that they should feel grateful uh, for what they have received as a benefit from the hand of another, and even function best when experiencing grateful emotions, why is it that they do, that they do not more consistently engage in such in their day-to-day -day lives? Why does genuine gratitude remain a transient and unpredictable occurrence for most people? Is it a limitation imposed by our neural architecture? This negativity bias that was built into our brains by evolution does not help. It leads us to either ignore or take for granted the blessings of life while we effortlessly harp on what irritates us. Now, our text today gives us another explanation. Romans chapter 1 and verse 21. For all they, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. The larger context of this verse, I'm not going to read the whole passage, but the larger context is that the Apostle Paul observed societies in which there was a, a, their main way of worship was to worship idols, images that they had set up. And this was in the, in the Greco-Roman Empire, and we have a record of how um, the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17 had visited Athens and this was his reaction when he saw it. He says, while Paul was waiting for Silas and Timothy in Athens, he was troubled because he saw the city was full of idols. And that's what the society was in which he grew up or that he was ministering in. Now, I don't want to get in too much into that background because I want us to get us, get us to the thanks issue. But we do have to kind of look at this a little bit. So just a little bit of background of idol worship. Paul was saying that it, here in, in Romans chapter 1 that people everywhere can know that there is a creator God just by looking at creation. There's this, just by looking at the way that our world is, we have this, this knowledge that comes to us. But some people choose to say, well, this world that we have that has been created was created by this image, this statue that I have made. This is a representation of the God who made this all. And Paul goes on to say that when they do that, they're suppressing truth. And when they suppress truth, it has negative effects on their life, on their outlook, on, on their moral compass. It just, their life starts to go down the tubes when they suppress the truth like this. So that's kind of the Reader's Digest version of Romans chapter 1. And, um, and so when we think about that, like maybe many of us, when we read that, we have this in our mind, well, that is not for here. We don't do that. I don't even know of anybody in Three Hills who does that. Like, like what, what is relevance does this have to us? It's like it's a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. That we don't, so we don't have to think about it. But now, in this next little bit, I found it very difficult to, to um, bring it home in a logical way. And so my, I, I want you to try to track with me here, but I'm having a difficult time. So you can pray for me as I'm trying, to, trying to, to describe this to you. How it is that we, even Christians in the church, can be worshiping idols. Just follow with me if you, if you would try to do that. Though we think of the term God, maybe with a small g of, of people who worship false gods or idols all around our world, or ourselves, those who worship Jehovah God, we would say a capital G God. 
There are certain ways that that has affected the way we look at life. We call that our worldview. There are th- ways that, that that belief has affected the way we look at life. And very often, those kinds of ways that it influences our worldview helps us to look at our life out there in and I, the way I've, I've described it here is through questions that we want to have answered. Um, it's like a, a, an invisible grid that we look at life through. We pass it through this idea that, that you know, what, what's going to happen in my life? Well, what's my God going to think about that? That's, that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. So here's some questions that I wrote down that help us to think about how a person... Now, this would be true for a person who believes in Jehovah God... But it might also be the same kind of questions a person who worships an idol might ask themselves. These questions. How would my God respond to this, whatever this is, circumstance that you're going through at a time? Would my God approve? Would my God be honored by or benefited from the decision that I make? Would I suffer negative consequences from my God if I did this? Will God supply my needs if I do this? Will I be able to live, continue living, if my God doesn't come through for me? Is my future improved by giving attention to my God? If I'm in trouble, can I trust my God to come through for me? So like I said, these are questions, you might not ever have thought about it, but these are really questions at the core of our being that we ask, that we wonder, any person who believes in a deity asks these kinds of questions in their deepest core. But here's where I hope it brings it close to home for us. Are there other kinds of pursuits that we give that same kind of influence that same kind of power in our lives, we give that kind of influence to. Here's an example. Let me change the word God in this list to the word investments. How would my investments respond to this? Would my investments approve? Would my investments benefit from this decision? Would I suffer negative consequences from my investments if I did this? Will my investments supply my needs if I do this? Will I be able to live if my investments don't come through for me? Is my future improved by giving attention to my investments? If I'm in trouble, can I trust my investments to come through for me? So you might say, oh, that's for rich people. They have problems with money, so it's not me. Here's another one. Let me change the word to relationships. How would my relationships respond to this? Would my relationships approve? Would my relationships be honored by or benefit from the decision that I make? Would I suffer consequences from my relationships if I did this? Will my relationships supply my needs if I do this? Will I be able to live if my relationships don't come through for me? Is my future improved by giving attention to my relationships? If I'm in trouble, can I trust my relationships to come through for me? You see, idol worship isn't just about someone who worships a statue and attributes the creation of the world to a statue. It has to do with what really influences our lives. What really dictates to us the things, the way we make decisions, the grid that we pass our life through when we think about our life and what really has power to change us and make us make decisions certain ways. Pastor Tim Keller in his book, Counterfeit God, says it this way. He says that our hearts have a way of corrupting even good things into bad things by making them the ultimate thing. We may have good pursuits, like loving relationships, but when we make them the highest thing in our life, 
they don't have the, they are in the place of God in our life. If they dictate to us things that even are more important to us than a relationship with God. It's kind of like, for those of you who have written or or read or watched the movie of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings storyline, the power, the ring of power from the Dark Lord Sauron can take good pursuits but make them into evil when they become the most important thing. If you remember in that storyline, some of the characters wanted to liberate slaves. They wanted to to defend their, their lands and they wanted to bring justice. But the ring made them willing to do anything, anything to achieve those goals. And it turns a good thing into and tramples down all other things to achieve those things, whether it be previously held values, whether they be morals, whether they be relationships. And wouldn't you say that we may be prone to do the same things from time to time? We're not like hobbits that have immunity or some kind of resistance to the effects. Rather, we get sucked into them too sometimes. Think of a biblical example with me. King Saul. Those of you who have heard the story know that King Saul was the first king of Israel. And he started off well. He was a humble man. He didn't want to be in the spotlight. He didn't want to have people noticing him. But there came a point somewhere along his journey where public approval and where where having people um, see him in a positive light became the most important thing in his life. And then what happened? Then he was willing to put his obedience to God and the things that were that God had told him to do, put him as a lesser thing as long as people would see him in a good light. It was more important for him to have people think well of him than it was to have God or obey God. I don't think I need to ask if we have idols in our hearts. It's determining really what they are. So now let's go back to our text now. For all they, though they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now we can see ourselves in that text, can't we? That even though we might know God, it is possible for us to take our eyes off of God and not have him to be the most important in our life, but put him at a lower place. But if we look at this verse in a different way, maybe reverse it a bit, it gives us the answer, the antidote to the temptation that we may have to elevate idols of the heart in our lives. The way that we would fight those things or the antidote are the two things that Paul mentions here. Glorifying God and giving thanks to him. So let's think about what it means to glorify God first of all. That one in some senses is a no-brainer. Because when we think about God and glorifying him, that means putting him on the top. Saying that he's the most important. That he is the one that, that um, all else is organized under in our life. That as we know him to be the top, he's the most important, then everything falls into place underneath that. In uh, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, he talks about the idea of the temptation of money becoming the idol. And this is what Jesus said. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and desperate despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We know that to be the case. We know that we need to have God to be the top. And when we do that, that puts everything else in order. To glorify God is to unseat all rivals in the throne of our life. 
So that one makes sense. But the thanks part, that's why I said this text has always intrigued me. Why did Paul put thanks in here? Of all the things that he could have put in to help us to make sure that our, the idols of our heart are dethroned, why did he put thanks in there? And really what it comes down to is we have to think about what thanksgiving does and is in our life. So th- first of all, thanksgive- thankfulness is acknowledging the input of another in our life. Giving credit to another for the contributions that they have made to us. Being indebted in a way of, of an, from what another has given to us. There's recognition, appreciation, and gratitude. It's really recognizing that we haven't been the one who's in charge. Somebody else has contributed to who we are and what has happened in our life. We're saying there's other, other ones, and we're recognizing them. And so what does that do? That takes us off the top and puts us down a, a notch. Every time we recognize that someone else has contributed to our life, we're taking ourselves down a notch and putting someone else and giving them recognition. So thanks takes the spotlight off our own self-sufficiency and our own independence and puts that spotlight on another. And so when we say thanks to God, we're actually putting a spotlight on him that maybe has gone away or maybe has not been not as, as much as it should have been. When we take time to really acknowledge the input that God has had on our lives, it's then that we're actively fighting the poisonous tendency that we have in our lives to serve the idols of our heart. And we administer an antidote, and that is thankfulness. Every time that, or everything good in our lives, we actually really can contribute to God. The scriptures tell us that. Whether it's a a paycheck that we've actually earned, but God gave us the health and the job. Those of you who've lost your jobs know how much we need to attribute a job as something that we give God thanks for. Or whether it's the crops that we plant. Yeah, we put them in the ground, but God was the one who even made that seed to work properly. And so... The good things in our life, these are things that we need to uh, give God credit for. And when we do, that's when things start to become aligned properly under him. James 1.17 says, Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down from us from God the Father who created all lights in heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. There have been times in Connie and my life where in our ministry life, there have been some pretty rough spots. Whether they be financial stresses that we've had, whether it's been pressures in ministry where the relationships that we had with church people have gone south. Even in our family, sometimes there have been some strains and difficulties that we've had to face. And in those times, especially in those times, it's easy for us to be able to try to work it out on our own. Whether it be to borrow more money, whether it be to lash out and criticize or defend ourselves. But in reality, when we do those kinds of things, those are us trying to set ourselves up and it, as the one who's in charge and actually putting an idol on the throne of our life. But... In those times, we've taken some times and and very formally, as we're falling asleep in bed, we would take some time to be thankful. What we would do is, this was our exercise, and we've done it even recently, that we would think of 10 things that we would be thankful for before we would go to sleep, before we turn the light out. 10 things. And then the next day, If the cloud hasn't lifted, we think of 10 things, and they have to be different. 10 more things. And then the next day, 10 more things until the cloud lifts. And when we do that, it is really aligning ourselves under God and giving him the the proper 
um, allegiance, the proper perspective on our life. And when we do that, that's when we see him giving us a new perspective on our life. Just like the guy in the study said, when we thanks, it changes us. It gives us a new perspective. So there's actually physical benefits to being thankful. But here's a verse. I found this one. This was quite interesting for me. Psalm 50, verse 23. Those people honor me who bring me offerings to show thanks, and I, the Lord, will save those who do that. You see, God, as we are willing to show our gratitude to him, he is there for us. And, the, and, and our gratitude in him actually does something for us. Yeah, we're supposed to be thanking him because he deserves the thanks, yes. But I'm just coming here to tell you that there's even benefits for us when we're thankful. So thanksgiving is actually an antidote for selfishness and, and idols of the heart. Could I have the, the team come up? They're going to be leading us in a closing song. But as they're coming up, I would just like us to think about where we're at this Thanksgiving. Yeah, we go through a list and we say we're thankful for our family, we're thankful for the food on the table, we're thankful for the harvest that's coming in. But I want us to think a little bit deeper this year. Are there idols of our hearts? Things that we're depending on even more than God to get us through. That bank account. Those relationships we have. Do we need to dethrone those things? And we dethrone them by thanking God for the benefits we have and the things that he has done for us. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Lord, I'm thankful that this teaching is here in the scriptures and it's very practical. All of us realize our tendencies to be able to go to ourselves, try to pull ourselves up by the, our own bootstraps, but here we are told that even the, the exercise of giving you thanks has a benefit to us. That we are um, be able to, to be draw close to you, be able to see our circumstances from a different perspective, and to be able to know that we're in your hands. So thank you for the, this teaching and help us today to, be, to put that into practice as we go about our business, as we meet together with family, as we carve a turkey, that we have so much to be thankful for. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing together. We are so
the benediction today comes from Psalm 107, verses 8 and 9. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for his wonderful things he has done for them. For he satisfies the thirsty, fills the hungry with good things. Lord bless you as you go.